It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, live from Jerusalem. Our top story tonight. Three hundred and fifty missiles fired. Israel's president says they're now assessing how to respond to Iran's first ever direct attack. This is a declaration of war, not not because we are restrained and because we know the repercussions and because we have deliberations with our partners, we are considering all options. Israel says it intercepted 99% of the Iranian attack drones and missiles. Rishi Sunak confirms the RAF were involved in shooting them down. How to respond and when Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu holds several hours of talks with his war cabinet. Meanwhile, G7 leaders hold a virtual meeting on the crisis and discuss the possibility of sanctions against Iran. The United Nations Security Council has gathered for an emergency meeting tonight. We'll have the latest from New York. We woke up the kids at 2 a.m. and we ran outside because there was no bomb shelter in the house. Uh, and yeah, and you have to like reassure the kids that everything will be fine even though you are frightened. And feeling shaken and vulnerable, I've been speaking to people here in Jerusalem in the aftermath of last night's attack. Also ahead on Sky News at 10, tributes to the victims of the Sydney shopping centre stabbing attack, which left six people dead. A big twist in the Premier League title race after defeats for both Arsenal and Liverpool. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening from Jerusalem. It's now just over 24 hours since Iran launched a missile attack in retaliation for the Israeli strike on Iran's consulate in Syria. In that time, we've seen world leaders urging restraint amid concerns about an escalation in tensions here in the Middle East. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convened a meeting of his war cabinet today. Reports suggest the majority of members favour a response to Iran's attack but there is a split on the scale and timing of it. Tonight, an IDF spokesperson says Israel remains on high alert and has approved defensive and offensive military plans. Israel says 350 missiles and drones were fired by Iran and that some also came from Iraq, Syria and Yemen, but 99% were intercepted before entering Israeli airspace. The military ordered residents to take cover in the Golan Heights near the border with Syria and Lebanon and the southern towns of Nevatim, Dimona and the resort city of Elat. Dimona is home to the country's main nuclear facility. Some ballistic missiles did reach Israeli territory, causing minor damage to the Nevatim air base and a young girl was injured in the country's south. Our first report tonight is from our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle. Iran launched the attacks in waves. More than 300 missiles and drones were fired at Israel in an unprecedented assault whilst the world held its breath. They arrived in Israeli airspace just before 2 a.m. in the morning. These were intercepts over Jerusalem. The holy city was under attack and the skies above alight with the trails of Israel's air defence system. The region had been on edge for days, but this was a bigger, far more dangerous retaliation than many predicted. As the nation braced, airspace was closed over Jordan and Iraq. Flights in the air headed for Tel Aviv were turned back. The US Embassy told its staff to take shelter and schools in Israel have been ordered to close for the next two days. The Israeli military released this video of the drones and missiles being intercepted. Most were taken down outside of Israeli airspace. The few missiles that did fall within the country only caused minor damage. Most were intercepted before they reached Israeli airspace. This was the remains of a missile shot down over northern Iraq. 
Tonight, Israel's war cabinet met in Tel Aviv to assess the attack and discuss a response. The Israeli military spokesman said that options have been agreed. Over the last few hours, we approved operational plans for both offensive and defensive action. We will continue to protect the state of the state of Israel and together with our partners, we will continue to build a more secure and stable future for the entire Middle East. The US president has condemned the attack in what he calls the strongest possible terms, but has urged Israel to take the win and not do anything to escalate the situation. The Israeli president, though, told Sky News that the attack was a declaration of war. This is like a real war. Um, I mean, this is a declaration of war, not, not because we are restrained and because we know the repercussions and because we have deliberations with our partners, we are considering all options and I'm quite confident that we will take the necessary steps that are necessary to protect and defend our people. We are not war seekers. Iran has said that its action is finished and warned Israel not to respond. From our point of view, this operation is over and there is no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. The attacks were celebrated by regime supporters in Tehran. They might be satisfied by the response, but Israel might feel it has no choice but to retaliate. This could still be just the beginning. Well, we're going to be speaking live to Alistair in a moment, but we have some breaking news now. We can head back to the United Nations, that emergency Security Council session where the Israeli ambassador, Gilad Erdan, has just been speaking. Let's have a listen to what he had to say. I called on this council to take concrete action against the Ayatollah regime. I made it clear that Iran and its hegemonic ambitions of global domination must be stopped before it drives the world to a point of no return, to a regional war that can escalate to a world war. Sadly, no action was taken. And last night, the world witnessed an unprecedented escalation that serves as the clearest proof for what happens when warnings aren't heeded. Israel is not the boy who cried wolf. We have been screaming from the rooftops for years, trying to wake up the international community, but to no avail. If only this council would have inter internalized my words, it would not have needed the bone-rattling explosions of last night's attack to wake it up. Colleagues, last night, Iran proved again that it cares nothing, nothing for Islam or Muslims. Well, the Israeli ambassador talking there about the threat that Israel claims Iran poses to the world. We have our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel, with us now. Lots of people here, Ali, talking about a response from the Israelis, almost that they have to respond. Um, what can we expect? I think the feeling is, is that Israel have to respond. At least that is the feeling here. Uh, that seems to be the prevailing feeling within the military and the war cabinet that's been meeting this evening in Tel Aviv has come to that conclusion. The question is, is how and when, and we gather the war cabinet is divided over those two issues. There are multiple options for the Israelis. They could target Iran directly. I think that would be the most escalatory response. That would be the toughest response. But they could look at their proxies around the region, Hezbollah, for example, over the border in Lebanon. And then the question of when. Do they go immediately whilst things are still hot? Or do they bide their time? But, but we are talking about a military response and all of the dangers in terms of the escalation that that might bring to the rest of the Middle East. I think we assume it would be a military response. We've seen them take out senior Iranian officials before on more covert assassinations, even within Iran itself, that aren't necessarily immediately attributable to Israel. So all of these options will be open to them, but at the same time, they will be coming under a lot of pressure from their key allies, 
allies that helped them last night, like Britain, America and France, helped them defend the skies of Israel, but now saying, leave it at that. We don't want to be dragged into a war with you. We're here to defend you, but we do not want this to go further. Ali, thank you very much. And that pressure is certainly building as diplomatic tensions are rising. Israel's allies, of course, are trying to put pressure on them after the strike on the region. Now, earlier, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, joined other G7 leaders for crisis talks amid fears of possible reprisals. Here's our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. President Biden told the Iranians not to escalate. They ignored him. Now he's urging the Israelis to step back from the brink. Whether and how the Israelis will respond, uh, that's going to be up to them. We understand that and respect that. But the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. Will Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu draw a line under last night's events or up the ante too? There is huge pressure on him from allies, including Britain, to show restraint. If this attack had been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate. And we stand by the security of Israel and the wider region, which is, of course, important for our security here at home too. And what we now need is for calm heads to prevail. The Prime Minister joined other G7 leaders on video conference, all urging restraint and condemning Iran for the attacks. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron spoke to his Iranian counterpart, tweeting later, I made clear that Iran must stop these reckless attacks, de-escalate and release the MSC Ares, an Israeli-linked ship seized by Iran. Israel is under diplomatic pressure not to retaliate now. But can it let an attack by its sworn enemies in Iran go unpunished? Enemies who have in the past called for Israel to be wiped off the map. Iran seems buoyed up by its attacks. Government mouthpieces claiming it sets a precedent. Its military may well repeat. Iran has struck the Israeli regime directly. And that means that from now on, if the Israeli regime targets Iranians anywhere, that Iran will hit back at Israel itself. Iran says it had no choice but to retaliate for the attack on its consulate in Damascus earlier this month, blamed on Israel, that killed more than a dozen Iranians. It says the episode is now concluded after last night's attacks. But Israel may not see it that way after the first direct Iranian onslaught against its territory. All eyes now on Israel and what it does next. I think it is uh, about a 50-50 whether they decide to go and take this a step further. They would like, I think, to use this opportunity to have the Iran conflict take the spotlight off of the famine and the devastation in, in Gaza. If Israel retaliates to this attack, Iran says it'll strike back with greater force. What we've seen so far this weekend would then just be the prelude to something even bigger. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. Our U.S. correspondents Mark Stone and James Matthews join us live now from Washington and New York, where the United Nations Security Council is meeting tonight. Uh, to Mark first at the White House, where Joe Biden watched last night's attack unfold in the Situation Room. Mark, it, it must have been a very tense night, a very nervous night indeed. Uh, tense, Alex, is the word uh, that US officials used today when they briefed us and gave us a picture uh, of those few hours last night in the Situation Room. President Biden came back to the White House a day earlier than had been expected. Uh, his team, he and his team knew that a response from Iran was coming. They, they knew because it had been signposted by Iran. And so for the past 12 days or so, President Biden had been uh, instructing his team to prepare uh, and to prepare to defend Israel to the maximum uh, extent. Uh, but they did not realize quite how audacious the Iranian attack would be. They expected perhaps that drones uh, would be flown, but maybe they would be from Iranian proxies in the region. They didn't necessarily believe that it would come from Iran itself. And they certainly didn't believe uh, that there would be ballistic missiles among them. Ballistic missiles which President Biden 
was in the Situation Room when he saw those in the air flying through Middle Eastern airspace, airspace entering Israeli airspace. And officials said that they watched and didn't know at that point how successful the Israeli air defences, uh, bolstered by uh, American, British and French jets, how successful they would be. And so there was uh, a moment of genuine concern that this Middle Eastern conflict was about to spiral out of control. In the end, officials described it as uh, a spectacularly defeated attack. And that, I think, is how uh, the Americans would like the Israelis to see this, to see it as a win. Yes, it was an unprecedented attack by Iran uh, on uh, Israel, but... Uh, Israel, with the help of allies, including, crucially, Arab nations as well, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, they shot down uh, these, uh, these drones and missiles. They defended Israel. That is a military and diplomatic success. The hope by the Americans uh, is that the, is the Israelis will not respond. I think the reality is, though, that the, is the Americans know the Israelis will have to respond. The question is when it comes and how. I think the, the pressure will be to bide time, don't respond immediately, and remember, America will say to Israel, remember the consequences if they come. Yeah, the war cabinet's been meeting here, Mark. We are waiting for that response from Israel. James Matthews in New York, emergency session of the Security Council. Um, what have we learned tonight? What are we hearing in the, uh, in the UN? Yeah, hi, Alex. This was called, uh, this meeting following Israel saying that Iran needs to be condemned for its actions last night, calling it an assault on Israeli sovereignty and a danger to international peace. That has been echoed in the past few minutes by the Israeli ambassador invited as a relevant party to this meeting of Security Council members. There won't be any vote today, no resolution, essentially. It's an opportunity for these countries to, to air their views. We can hear the political ramifications of events last night as the political context is shaped moving forward. What we have had over the past hour uh, has been along the traditional UN security uh, lines, really, behaving according to form, antagonism, self-interest, traditional alliances. Uh, we see Britain and the United States uh, standing very strongly against uh, Iran's actions, standing with Israel in support of Israel. We heard from the Russians criticizing the West, saying that the West didn't come rushing to Iran's aid when there was that bombing in the Iranian consulate in Damascus. The United States Deputy Ambassador, um, he pointed the finger at Iran, said that uh, the United Nations Security Council should explore additional measures to hold Iran accountable. Iran's ambassador is speaking right now. Let's have a listen to him. The Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. This concluded action was necessary and proportionate. It was precise and only targeted military objectives and carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation and prevent civilian harm. Madam President, we thank those members of the Council who condemned the Israeli armed attack against our diplomatic premises in Syria. Regrettably, in this chamber, certain members of the Council, including the US, UK, and France, have chosen once again to turn a blind eye to reality and overlook the root causes contributing to the current situation. In hypocritical behavior, these three countries falsely blamed and accused Iran without considering their own failures to uphold their international commitment to peace and security in the region. They made unsuccessful attempts to use lies, manipulate the narrative, spread disinformation, and engage in a destructive blame game. All the while, they deliberately disregarded Iran's inherent right to respond to the violation of a fundamental principle of international law the inviolability of diplomatic representative and premises. Moreover, 
They ignore the underlying root causes of the current situation in the region. For over six months now, these countries, especially the United States, have shielded Israeli from any responsibility for the Gaza massacre. While they have denied Iran's inherent right to self-defense against the Israeli armed attack on our diplomatic premises, at the same time, they shamefully justified the Israeli massacre and genocide against the defenseless Palestinian people under the pretext of self-defense. They made cynical attempt to justify and cover up the atrocities of the Israeli regime against the people of Palestine by arbitrary and misleading interpretation of self-defense. Madam President, following the Israeli regime, cowardly terrorist and armed attack against our diplomatic premises in Damascus, the Syrian Arab Republic, on the 1st of April, we notified the UN Security Council and Secretary General of such international wrongful act, as well as of Iran's inherent right under international law to respond to such terrorist armed attack. Also, in a phone conversation with the UN Secretary General on 2nd April, Iran Foreign Minister discussed the situation and called for taking appropriate action and a strong condemnation from the international community for this horrific crime. We called upon the Security Council to strongly denounce this unjustified criminal and terrorist act, taking decisive and appropriate measure to bring the perpetrators to justice swiftly and prevent the requirements of the such horrible crime against the diplomatic premises of any member state. Regrettably, the Security Council has failed in its duty to maintain... There you go. That's uh, Iran's ambassador speaking to members of the UN Security Council, accusing them of cynicism, hypocrisy in their posture towards his country. Iran's case is that its actions last night were legitimate and appropriate underneath the UN Charter because its sovereign territory, its consulate in Damascus, had been attacked by Israel. That's its justification for what went on last night. As I say, Alex, what we're seeing here is the, the politics of this being shaped in terms of the way forward. This is not the last we will hear from inside that Security Council chamber. Certainly, if the Americans have their way, they're talking about the Security Council having an obligation not to let Iran's actions last night go unanswered. So we will be here again, uh, and we will hear those accusations on either side again. I think the shift that we've had overnight is a shift in political dynamic as it relates to Israel. Israel has long criticised the United Nations for being biased, for being unfairly critical of his, its actions in relation to the war with Hamas. We now have an Israel invested in UN support with a case to present to the United Nations Security Council on the back last night of a threat to Israel. So, you know, Israel has shifted. Its position has been reset to some degree closer to an international community that has been critical of Israel, but an international community that does not want escalation, and that is in Israel's Gift. Some start warnings about escalation here, particularly from the Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, who, in his words, said the Middle East is on the brink. The way ahead, he said, was to defuse and to de-escalate. Yeah, start warnings about escalation and no doubt that the diplomacy will rumble on. Uh, James Matthews in New York, Mark in Washington, thank you both for bringing us the latest. Now, let's look in some more detail now at the attack drones and missiles used by Iran with our security and defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark. The Iranian attack on Israel was a pretty extensive affair. 331 different missiles of various sorts thrown against Israel from a wide geographical area. And so most of the missiles came from Iran. Some came from Iraq. Some came from Syria. Some came from Yemen, right at the bottom of the Red Sea, and some came across the border from Lebanon with Hezbollah. 
They were a mixture of drones, cruise missiles, and most crucially, ballistic missiles. And it's the ballistic missiles that the Israelis would really worry about. And these are the ballistic missiles taking off. Um, those missiles themselves are very hard to stop, and these almost certainly were probably Karam Shah missiles or Shahib 3 missiles, something like that. We're not sure at this stage, but there were a lot of them. About 110 were launched, and 103 of them were intercepted. Seven of them got through. And although the Israelis say that they intercepted, along with their allies, 99% of everything that was thrown at them, that seems to be true, there were some close calls because there's also some footage of the Iron Dome system right above the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This is the most holy place for three great religions. And there we can see that, in fact, um, they were defending only a few thousand feet above the Temple Mount itself. So some, probably, drones got really quite close. It was probably a, a, a narrower victory for the defence than uh, a lot of Israeli politicians may have made out uh, in the hours afterwards. The seven ballistic missiles that really got through um, were against the Navatim uh, air base in southern Israel. And that's uh, in the Negev desert, uh, deep in the south. But the Navatim air base is really important, symbolically, because that's the air base from which the F-35s that attacked Syria two weeks ago, which began this whole cycle of what this was all about, that's where they took off from. And so hitting that base allowed the Iranians to say, we have hit the base from which the attack started uh, on the 1st of April. Most people would say, OK, well, honours are even. The Americans are certainly saying to uh, Israel, call it a draw, you know, take the victory as such as you've got it, leave it. The rest of the world is saying, leave it. Benjamin Netanyahu is very unlikely to say that. This is the first time that Israel has been successfully targeted in its homeland by Iran. And Netanyahu always believes on having the last word militarily. He has indicated, his cabinet is indicating, that they will do something within the next 48 hours. So we won't have long to find out what that will be. Well, this crisis has already dragged in a number of countries, one of them being Britain. Our defence and security editor, Deborah Haynes, is in Westminster. Uh, Deborah, what did the British involvement look like last night? And let's say there is retaliation from Israel. What could British involvement look like going forwards? Well, just on your second point, limited, because the UK military is limited in its capability after decades of cuts, which don't look very timely given the state of the world right now. But in terms of what the UK did, they, they, they increased the number of jets that the UK has in a base in Cyprus. Some of those, jet, those jets operated last night. They took out a number of drones that were being launched towards Israel. But the UK has been very careful um, to be limited in the amount of information that it's releasing about the action that it did, which contrasts with other operations that it's done since this crisis erupted with its operations against the Houthis in Yemen, which it has given a huge amount of information about. But I think it's important to really stop and pause and reflect on the extraordinary conflation of events that are happening right now that are challenging a global order that's existed since the end of the Second World War and has really favoured the US and Western powers. First of all, we had two years ago Vladimir Putin defying Western calls not to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, going ahead, invading, still conducting that operation now, despite all of the effort of Western allies to support their Ukrainian partners on the ground. Russia is the one that is gaining ground slowly but surely at the moment. And then in the Middle East, Iran, um, in defiance again of warnings from President Joe Biden, from the UK, from others, not to retaliate, not to act in the wake of what Iran has alleged was Israel's attack against its consulate in Syria. And Iran not just responding, but responding with such great force, with over 100 ballistic missiles, as well as these drones, launched against Israel in huge defiance of these Western warnings, really challenging the West's ability to influence events. And if it cannot manage to do that, then it, it really does represent a fundamental risk to the world order that we all have lived in right now. Deborah, thank you very much for your insights. Now, as we've been hearing, Rishi Sunak has confirmed that the RAF fighter jets shot down Iran attack drones headed towards Israel. 
as he condemned Tehran's dangerous and unnecessary escalation. Well, let's go live to Downing Street now and our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen. Tamara, good to have you on tonight. Um, tell us, what's been the political reaction to these events that are unfolding here in the Middle East? Well, since Rishi Sunak confirmed that UK warplanes had been involved in shooting down some of those Iranian drones heading towards Israel, he has been on a call with other Western leaders in the G7 and their collective message, as well as the message from Downing Street, has been very clear on two counts. Staunch support for Israel under unprecedented direct attack from Iran. Rishi Sunak has called the Iranian attack reckless and accused them of sowing chaos, but also a very clear call to avoid what the G7 leaders call in their statement uncontrollable regional escalation. They want Israel and Iran not to escalate this further. And I think the key questions as MPs come back to Parliament tomorrow after a two-week break will be whether that coalition of allies, of course, uh, led by the US, but also France and some Arab countries who came to Israel's aid to stop this attack having devastating consequences, whether uh, those co coalition of allies can exert an influence in trying to stop this escalating. Clearly, warnings from the White House uh, and from our Foreign Secretary to the Iranians not to do this went unheeded, and whether they can continue to have an influence in the coming days. Rishi Sunak was under no obligation to consult Parliament before doing this, but I'm, I expect he will come to Parliament tomorrow and among the questions will be what will be the next steps. I expect there will be discussion of further sanctions on Iran and whether the Revolutionary Guards will be put on the UK's terror list. But there will also be bigger questions about if this does escalate, as uh, it's expected it will, will the UK have further military involvement? So far there's been consensus across the spectrum, Labour also supporting uh, the, the action of, of the RAF. Could that start uh, to fray? And also there's uh, the question um, for, for the Prime Minister um, of where, where this goes in the coming days and whether... Um, and, and there's been a live debate in the UK about whether we should be spending more money here on defence and on defending ourselves. And I'm sure that will get also a mention this week. Tomorrow, Cohen and Downing Street, thank you very much. And tomorrow morning at 20 past seven, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, will be on Sky News Breakfast with Kay Burley. Now, here in Israel, many people are still feeling nervous following last night's airstrikes. I've been speaking to people on the streets of Jerusalem to gauge their reaction to Iran's attack. A new day in Israel, but the unprecedented attack by Iran has left this country feeling shaken. School and university have been cancelled for security reasons. Students Talia and Simona have met up in this cafe to discuss the crisis. I hope we'll be smart enough that it won't get worse. And I think last night was a big um, win. A big win for us, anyways. Because our army saved us. We were both very, very scared. We were on the phone. But I think after October 7th, nothing's really... I feel like we've already seen the worst. The events of October the 7th are still raw, but the attack last night has increased that sense of vulnerability. The Israeli people, they feel trapped with what's happening. We woke up the kids at 2 a.m. and we ran outside because there was no bomb shelter in the house. Uh, and yeah, and you have to like reassure the kids that everything will be fine, even though you are frightened. For many Israelis, then, this is a pivotal moment. People go about their business as normal, but this is the first time in history the nation's been attacked directly by Iran. Israelis were expecting something. There had been numerous security warnings in the days leading up to the attack. But the size of it has shocked many, and attention now is focused on what will be Israel's response. At Channel 12, the station has switched to continuous rolling coverage. Military experts and journalists discuss the crisis on a programme called Israel at War. The panel is trying to decipher what will happen next. I don't think people are happy today. 
it's not a cheerful, hey, we beat them. No, it, this is not uh, the circumstance, I don't think, because we have no idea if it, is, if it is behind us. And to be honest with you, we still we have the front in the south with Hamas, and there is a front in the north. Are we done with Iran? Or what will happen if Israel decides to retaliate? Um, is it going to drag to um, a broader war in the region? And you have to bear in mind, we are more than six months in a situation of war. It's not something that only started last night. It started October 7. The next 48 hours will be crucial, but the Jewish state stands on the brink of war with a major regional power. Israelis are used to living under threat, but this is new and these are difficult days. Well, as many Israelis are trying to understand what this unprecedented attack from Iran means, the government of Israel is trying to calibrate and work out what its response will be. We know from the war cabinet meetings today that they think there will be a response. Israeli officials have been briefing that it would, could very well be a military response, but they are split on the, the timing and size of it. Certainly the whole of the Middle East is waiting to see what it will be and the whole of the region remains extraordinarily tense. Well, that's all from me and the team in Jerusalem for now. Back to Gillian at the Sky News Centre for the rest of tonight's news. Alex, thank you. A mother, an architect and a security guard are among the six victims who died in a stabbing at a Sydney shopping centre yesterday. They were killed by Joel Cauchy, who is said to have had a history of mental health issues. Police believe his attack was not terror-motivated. Our correspondent, Ashish Joshi, has this report. Pekria Dacia, Ashley Good, Dawn Singleton, Faraz Tahir, Jade Young. All victims in a killing that Australia is struggling to understand. And this is the mass murderer, 40-year-old Joel Couchy, appearing relaxed as he buys lunch in a noodle bar. Just a few hours later, Couchy went on a bloody rampage through a packed Sydney shopping mall, stabbing to death six people. First responders were met with a scene of total carnage. The last interaction we had with this gentleman, this man, the offender in this instance, was in December 2023, where he was street checked on the Gold Coast. There was no interaction since December 2023 uh, with this gentleman and from our understanding in speaking to the family uh, he has been itinerant and has moved to New South Wales. On a busy Saturday afternoon at the start of the school holidays the popular Westfield Bondi Junction was busier than usual. Panic spread with reports of the attack. Rowan Anderson saw it all and filmed the terror as it unfolded. And I took my footage, it was about 15 seconds, maybe before he was shot by the police officer. Um, and he'd already killed a number of people at that point, but we didn't know that, we had no idea what was going on. We just saw a person on the level below us with a knife running around. Um, and you, yeah, you just in disbelief that it's happening in Australia, in Bondi. One of the survivors of this horrific attack is a nine-month-old baby girl who was passed as strangers by her dying mother. Ashley Good did not survive, but the first aid given to her daughter by two men saved the baby's life. The Australian Prime Minister has paid tribute to the bravery of police inspector Amy Scott. She shot dead Couchy after responding alone to the emergency. Couchy's family have offered their sympathies to the families of the victims. They also said Couchy had battled with mental health issues since his teens. This might help to explain the slaughter, but will do little to ease the pain of so many grieving families. Ashish Joshi, Sky News. Time now to get the latest sports news from Julia. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Well, I want to know how sustainable you are, Sebastian, because uh, you're only 36. Um, yeah. You've only been out the Formula One for a year and a bit. Are you potentially on the driver market for, for next season? 
Well, potentially, I'm because I haven't got a drive. But uh, the question is, am I looking for one? I think it depends on the, uh, you know, on the, on the package. Um, I retired from Formula One not to come back, but I also did say that you never know. So, I think it still stands. Obviously, there's th things that I miss, which is mostly the competition, um, and things that I don't miss. So, um, yeah, that hasn't changed. Obviously, uh, life is very different if you're not. Uh, involved. I just want to press you a bit on the, the now or never aspect of maybe coming back because as I say that the conditions might they not offer you a better opportunity than maybe in the next year and are you mindful of that as, as you yeah, make for sure decision? that for sure that you know the thoughts cross my mind I'm thinking about it uh, obviously I retired uh, not to come back but I retired to retire so um, nothing in this regard has changed but um, you never know, obviously, if you know, a lot of things starting to move because Lewis has moved and now the potential of Max maybe, I don't know, pulling off a surprise. You, you don't know. So um, I don't know if the odd circumstance starts to happen. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. That was the sport for you. Uh, coming up, we're going to have the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the chief foreign commentator for the Eye, Michael Day, and editor for the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons. Amongst the stories we'll be discussing, this on the front of the Metro, its headline, Reign of Terror. We'll be right back. Do stay with us. lucky and blessed that I got the opportunity to do that and kind of start and open conversations about uh, disability casting in the industry, especially musical theatre. Um, but there, there is certainly a sense of kind of um, why is it taking this long to kind of this to happen? You know, it's 2024 and I'm very thankful that I got to be the first, but it's a bit of a shame, you know? Why has it taken so long? I mean, is this about mm. how plays are written? Is it about casting? What's the issue here, do you think? I'm not too sure. I, th I think uh, it can be about casting, but I, I think a broader issue potentially is kind of the access to London theatres, um, especially within the West End, where a lot of musicals are. There's a lot of London theatres that are incredible, but often listed buildings. So I think the infrastructure of that um, needs to change. But we are getting there, and I'm glad that uh, this show and me doing what I did hopefully can start those conversations, which is really exciting. Um, I think that is where the industry needs to go next, is kind of having uh, characters that aren't written uh, as a disabled person, but can be played by somebody who's disabled or in a wheelchair. I think that is starting to happen and hopefully can happen more. The show was The Little Big Things. Um, it closed on the 2nd of March um, and it was really well received. Um, we felt very blessed. I mean, it's a story, it's about a guy called Henry Fraser, who, uh, when he was 17, had a spinal cord injury on holiday in Portugal and his life changed and he became a famous mouth artist and uh, motivational speaker. And his life is incredible and he's written his memoir and we, we turned it into a musical.
Welcome back. You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with Chief Foreign Commentator for the Eye, Michael Day, and the editor for the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Reign of terror, that's how the Metro describes Iran's attack on Israel. The eye reflects on G7 nations warning that Iran is risking an uncontrollable wider war following the attack. And that warning also makes the front page of The Guardian, which has that the US will not take part in any counter-offensive. The Financial Times reports on Israel's war cabinet convening to discuss potential responses to Iran's recent drone and missile attack. The Mail's headline reads, it's time the world faces evil empire in Tehran, reflecting the words of the Israeli president. And the Times looks at Israel's vow to seek revenge following yeah. last night, as Biden is said to have told Benjamin Netanyahu to take the win after most drones and missiles were shot down over Israel. The Express runs with the same story. And The Sun reports on the RAF helping Israel against Iran's attack and says it was the biggest air-to-air -air battle involving the UK since the Falklands. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by Michael Day and Jake Wallace-Simons. Welcome to both of you. We'll start with the Metro. I mean, there is one story that's leading... Uh, most of the the newspapers and that is the attack uh, the Iranian attack on Israel um, last night the headline in the Metro reign of terror Michael well this is the big story today I mean it is a reign of terror quite extraordinary 300 missiles raining down on Israel um, even more extraordinary perhaps 99% of them we were told were intercepted so thankfully there wasn't very much damage there was one I think a young girl has been injured which is obviously not good um, she's being treated. The big question now, of course, is what will Israel do next? Um, people are warning, quite rightly, I think, that we're on, the Middle East is on the verge of a major conflict now. And I think most people, including Israel's um, allies, America and the UK and France, the rest of them are saying, to urging it to be cautious. We don't want this escalation now. And they're hoping, as Sunak said tonight, that calm heads will prevail. And I hope they're right, actually. Mm. But, but they are still saying that it is ultimately um, still Israel's decision how they react, aren't they, Jake? Absolutely. I mean, the, um, the, the Metro is pointing out that RAF jets took part in shooting down uh, some of these projectiles, that were, some of these 350 projectiles that were coming over uh, into Israel. And that was really quite an interesting development because it wasn't just Britain and the US, who you might expect but also countries like Jordan and Saudi Arabia took part in defending Israel. And I think that that was a very, very significant development because, in my view, it showed that Iran may have miscalculated because in launching this attack, it actually accelerated the sense of solidarity and the alliance that's been building between Israel and the conservative Sunni states in recent years, since the Abraham Accords in particular, uh, since Donald Trump uh, presided over those being signed. And you can see why that's the case, because when the Saudis in 2019 suffered a similar attack from the Houthis on behalf of the Iranians, they fired all these rockets into the Saudi, uh, into Saudi territory and destroyed a lot of their oil capabilities, costing hundreds of millions of dollars. They were unable to defend themselves in the way that Israel has done. So they would have been looking at Israel and seeing this 99% success rate of defending uh, against Iranian uh, projectiles. And they were thinking to themselves, you know what? a normalisation deal, a peace deal with Israel, an alliance, actually makes more sense than it did the day before. Mm. Michael, do you agree with that? that I, well, I, I, I'd, make a step, I'd make the point that tonight, I mean, today, we, we hear the, the war cabinet is split in Israel, mm. what to do next. Um, some of the less extreme... Not on whether to respond, but... Well, not, no, but they're, 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 Israel, they of course it will respond. It's, as I think Benny Gantz, who has been brought in as a moderate voice, military expert in the cabinet, has said today, we'll, we will respond, but it will be when we've, built, we've rebuilt our um, regional coalition with our allies and we'll do it at our time in a sensible way. And I notice you mentioned Jordan. Of course, Jordan's actually... Israel owes, Jordan, Israel owes Jordan something because, I mean, Jordan, they've had unrest and now the government in Jordan will actually be in trouble, I think, for actually helping, you know, half of its population is Palestinian refugees. And I think Jordan 
will have to you know, lose some political points for its population for helping Israel. I'm not saying it shouldn't have done that, but I think Israel needs to think very carefully about how it actually responds in terms of build, rebuilding its, you know, its links with, with allies. And of course, not, not, not annoying America as well, which it's done quite consistently in the last few months. But and Jake, on, on that note, do you think that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his, his war cabinet will have uppermost in their mind the thoughts of America which is, and other allies, allies, which is to show restraint? I think it will obviously be factored into the equation in a, in a, in a major way. Um, but, it, you know, on the front of the FT, we had an interesting uh, analysis of uh, how Israel is weighing its options after the Iran attack yesterday. And a couple of quotes stood out for me. One was from, uh, from the American spokesperson for the, US, for the National Security Council, John Kirby, who said that we're not looking for a wider war with Iran. Mm. Uh, and that dovetails with another, Israel, another American official saying that they wouldn't participate in any retaliation. And this struck me as, once again, the Americans giving away the advantage to the Iranians by telling them, look, we're not going to take, take part in any retaliatory action. We want it all to calm down. If I was the Iranian leader, I'd be sitting there thinking, great, I've got a new normal here. I can fire 300-plus missiles at Israel and nobody's... And the Americans well, no, are not on, going to they retaliate. Say, exactly. so they should, should say, they say that we're what, going what to they, you if you want what, to go to war with Iran? What they should say uh, is they should condemn the attack They've in the strongest that. possible terms and leave it at that, leave them guessing. It's a, strategic, it's a massive strategic misstep to let the Iranians believe straight off the bat they're not going to receive a painful price from the American but they don't need them. Hold on a second. And this, is, and this is commensurate with uh, an overall attitude of appeasement towards the Iranians from the Biden administration, from the no, moment is, he this, took office. This is nonsense. Uh, it's not nonsense. It is nonsense. It's not let, nonsense. Let's, 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 no, 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 wait, let me finish the point. There's been, the, the Americans have been uh, evading their own sanctions legislation to release $16 billion of sanctions to the Iranians uh, up to October 7th and $10 billion since. If that, and turning a blind eye to things like oil sanctions and otherwise to uh, flood the, uh, the Iranian regime with, with cash uh, in the hope of some vague nuclear deal which has only resulted in the Iranians making more progress to a bomb than they ever have before. If that's not appeasement, I don't know what is. Well, hold on, look, look, the idea that America should be committing to helping Israel actually step up another attack and it makes things escalate even worse is nonsense. I mean, militarily, Israel is much more powerful in terms of its missile capability than Iran. We know that. The idea that America would actually be committing itself to actually joining in another round of escalation is clearly that's not going to happen. And well, Biden, Biden doesn't need a war in the Middle East. He does, he's got plenty of other things to be doing, and we don't want a war, war in the Middle East. I mean, and I, let's didn't, hope I didn't say that, that, that America should necessarily be contributing towards the retaliation, or even, or well, definitely not, well, we know to sparking a regional war. But what I did say is that it shouldn't be telegraphing its position to the Iranians I don't think it's straight a off the bat. I don't, I don't think, think that's very sensible at all. But the... even when we hear Iran saying that, that the mission is accomplished and the, the operation is over, um, and President Biden is saying, you know, take it as a, as a win. Do you not think that perhaps not retaliating might be a way forward to, no. to end? No, It's no. a draw. That's what President Biden's saying. No, absolutely. Call it a draw. Well, yeah, Biden's, as I said, been appeasing the Iranians for years and years with ultra-soft, dovish methods that have totally backfired and blown up in his face. As Naftali Bennett, the former Prime Minister of Israel, tweeted this evening, when the bully tries to hit you 350 times and succeeds only seven times, that's not a win. But hold on a second. That's what, not a win. What, what? And that's not how you win a war. And that's not how you deter an enemy. What we go, if there's no retaliation at all, what we will be in... There will is be a retaliation. New, is, no one's saying is, there won't a, be any is retaliation. A, ..is a new normal whereby Iran can send 350 missiles into Israeli airspace and get away with it and do it again and again and again, just like... Hamas, the message to no Hamas without, without destruction of Hamas be would be to do October 7th again and again and again. There's got to be a deterrent, an effective and painful deterrent to make sure this doesn't so what happen do you again. Suggest? Do you suggest they start what, a massive missile launch in, uh, uh, where in Tehran now? What do you look, suggest I'm not, I'm not a military planner. Well, it's I easy to know, say which, there I'm, should be a response. No, no, well, look, we're talking about principles and the principle, we are talking and about the principle I'm trying to question? illustrate, the principle I'm trying to illustrate is one of deterrence. Without deterrence, you've got a bigger problem because they'll do it again and again until you do have a right. full-blown war. Why, why do you think it was a good idea that Israel struck the consular building in Damascus? Because very many people don't think it was, including some of the Well, Americans. I don't know. I mean, I think... Well, it, that's an it's, important it's, question. It's, it's an important question. And it could... Look, it could be that it was an Israeli miscalculation. There's been well, a lot of... It's quite an important one. Let me speak. Let me speak. 
there's been lots of pressure, pressure on Major General Aaron uh, Khalifa, who is the head of military intelligence, no, that he may have miscalculated and, not, and underestimated the extent of the Iranian response to that. It could have been a miscalculation. I don't know. I'm not privy to the discussions around the War Cabinet table. None of us are. But Israel uh, well, hasn't actually claimed responsibility, have they? But it hasn't denied no. it. But what, we're talking, what we're talking about is, is principles. And in terms of the principles, when you're faced with a huge attack like this, you've managed to defend yourself fine. But as we saw on October the 7th, defences only go so far before the enemy gets through. And deterrent, the lesson of October the 7th is deterrent and, uh, and eliminating the threat before it gets to that stage is the only way well, towards security. But, see, the trouble is this government, this Netanyahu regime really, has actually helped Hamas. We've known that in the past. I mean, by this, by, with the distraction of the West Bank, with Hezbollah, they were turning a blind eye where £30 million a month was coming from Qatar into Hamas. But that wasn't to they? help Hamas, that was to it help wasn't. Gaza. It wasn't. I mean, that was part of Israeli... Where do you think Israeli, the money went? Do you think of... it all went to but libraries and But this was, this was part of Israeli right. naivety. It was part of something called the concept. Like was it naivety? Uh, it, was, it was part of the Israeli hopes that allowing money into the Strip, both via Qatar and also by allowing Gazan workers into Israel Jake. to work, would actually bring Jake stability. Michael, to, we will to, to continue Gaza. this discussion now, but we're going to have to uh, take a break now. Thank you very much for the moment. Coming up next on Sky News at 11, Israeli officials say the War Cabinet wants a response to the Iranian attack, but is divided over its timing and scale.